When I was in my mid-30s, a well-meaning individual told me that my depression was just in my head. If you just stop thinking about it and fill your mind with God's truth instead, your problems will disappear. They meant well and probably believed what they told me, but they had no idea what they were talking about. Mental health issues can't be written off with mere Christian cliches. Hello, Weirdos! I'm Pastor Darren. Welcome to the Church of the Undead. Here in the Church of the Undead, I can share ideas which are relevant to those who suffer with depression, need some encouragement, and for those who love or are just curious about the God of the Bible. And it doesn't matter if you're a weirdo in Christ or just a weirdo, everybody's welcome here at the Church of the Undead. And I use the word undead because here we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. If you want to join this weirdo congregation, just click that subscribe or follow button and visit us online at WeirdDarkness.com slash church. Full disclosure, I might use the term pastor because I've branded this feature as a church, but I do not have a theology degree, nor did I ever go to Bible college. I'm just a guy who gave his life to Christ in 1989 and has tried to walk the walk ever since and has stumbled a lot along the way. Because, like everybody else, I am an imperfect, heavily flawed human being. So please don't take what I say as gospel. Dig into God's Word yourself for confirmation, inspiration, and revelation. That being said, welcome to the Church of the Undead. As someone who's wrestled through depression for as long as I can remember, I understand how difficult it can be to reconcile mental health struggles as a follower of Jesus. I know what it's like to feel ashamed, broken, a failure. I've often prayed, asking God to heal my mind, to take away the negative feelings, and to rescue me from the darkness of depression. Anyone at any age can struggle with depression or anxiety, and there are some untrue assumptions being made about their suffering. Assumptions that need to be stopped immediately, or in Christianese, need to be rebuked. Imagine struggling with anxiety and somebody telling you that you need to stop thinking that way because anxiety is a failure to trust God. This belief mainly stems from Matthew 6 verses 25 through 34 and 1 Peter 5 and 7 and Philippians 4 verse 6. In each of these verses, Jesus essentially tells us, do not worry. Worry comes from the Greek word merimneola. It's translated as being anxious or careful with your thoughts or troubled by care. But here presents three types of anxiety, worldly, human emotion, and clinical disorders. When Jesus asks us not to worry about food, drink, clothing, or security in Matthew chapter 6, he's referencing worldly things. We're called to trust that God will provide, not to be obsessed with earthly gain. This is where anxiety can be sinful if we're not careful. It happens when we care more about gaining materialistic means than seeking His kingdom. Jesus calls us to cast our anxieties on Him. However, He also makes it known that we very well might be anxious regardless of our trust, especially when we're anxious about things that aren't earthly gains. The presence of anxiety is not the mistrust of God. One can trust, pray without ceasing, and endlessly give thanks to Him, yet still be anxious without sinning. How? Well, because the Lord Jesus Himself did it. On the night He was betrayed, Jesus knew anxiety. Sweating drops of blood, He'd face the most horrific death known to mankind. With earnest supplication and prayer, He asked God three times to remove the cup if possible. In other words, please take this away from me, God. I don't want to do this. That was not the Father's will, though, and Jesus humbly accepted that. Yet I am convinced at that moment, and many others, Jesus knew anxiety. He knew physical and mental pain, too. He knew the second type of anxiety really well, a human emotion and response. Jesus experienced everything we as humans experience, and yet He was spotless. He was sinless. 
He knows our pain and cares. But if that's true, would we say his pleading was in sin? His anxieties a failure to trust God? <laughs> of course not then why would we say the same about ourselves and our brothers and sisters in Christ amidst their sufferings? Anxiety is a human emotion and response to life's stressors. If I wreck my car, I might be apprehensive about driving the next time I get behind the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel! Individuals who go away for college have every right to be a little nervous about it. Everyone, to a degree, will experience anxiety in their lifetime. But for those who suffer from mental disorders, it can be much more severe. This third type of anxiety is not always a choice. This describes clinical anxiety. Disorders like generalized anxiety GAD, or obsessive-compulsive OCD, create unnecessary fears that aren't the same as somebody choosing to worry about everyday stressors or worldly securities. If you were to catch a cold or develop cancer, would someone say that's a sin? Actually, some do, but they are woefully wrong in their interpretation of Scripture. The truth is that sickness and disease are not sins, and neither is it a sin to be ill mentally. While there are tools and resources for anxiety like talk therapy, reciting Scripture, praying, deep breathing and getting plenty of sunshine, sometimes it also requires medication, whatever the process, it is a gradual healing or gradual control. Trauma takes time. Clinical anxiety takes time. Wounds take time. I can get help and do what's within my control, like caring for my body, mind, and soul, but clinical anxiety isn't a choice issue. It's a health and healing issue, often found outside of ourselves. Similarly, I have been told that my depression is a sin. Another misguided and incorrect Christian cliché. Depression is a group of conditions associated with the highs and lows of a person's mood, and, like anxiety, there can be two types – human emotion and clinical disorders. When depression is a human emotion, it's typically brief and or circumstantial. For example, if your pet or loved one dies, the sadness you feel is typical. It'd be normal to feel that way. In the book of Job, I believe Job faces this type of depression. He goes from blessed to cursed in a day's time and has every reason to mourn, yet after a period of suffering, God blesses him and he rejoices. In fact, God specifically says that in all of this, Job did not sin, Job 1 verse 22. But clinical depression is an emotion far beyond the occasional blues. It's characterized by sadness and apathy for at least two weeks or more. These feelings typically don't go away even after time or circumstances change. Dr. Mark Riley, co-founder and executive director of Soul Care Counseling, notes that Elijah may have illustrated characters of clinical depression. And that guy was a prophet of God. Elijah, that is, not Dr. Mark Riley. Facing fear, failure, fatigue, and futility, Elijah is overwhelmed and exhausted. He asks God to take his life because he simply doesn't want to face it anymore. That sounds like depression to me. How about you? Maybe you've even felt that way at some point. This depression goes beyond a feeling, as it often presents despair, desperation, even suicidal thoughts. And though this may look different from person to person, it is still clinical depression. King David, called a man after God's own heart by God himself, by the way, is also thought to have had some type of mental disorder because of his laments in the book of Psalms. In just a few sentences, he would praise the Lord for his goodness, but also ask to die. Bipolar, anyone? In these examples, individuals don't choose to have depression, just like they don't choose to have anxiety. Depression is often a clinical diagnosis, an illness not a sin. And just like physical illness, mental illness needs to be treated, not reprimanded. God illustrates this best in his response to each of these three scenarios we've talked about. When Job was stripped barren, he remained faithful to God amidst his suffering. And though others may have told him, hey, you're sinning, just look at what's happening to you, it must be something you've done, that was never God's reply. 
In the end, he was more blessed than he began. Elijah faced great turmoil and persecution in his lifetime. So many people wanted him dead that he too wished to just die and get it over with. But when God heard his pleas, God said, rest and eat. This journey is too much for you. He's always in the business of providing what we need. David felt many emotions, but was always authentic and vulnerable with his Creator, and though his suffering was also great, God praised him for his commitment. I hope you can see here that in each of these examples, regardless of emotional or clinical depression, God gave help, not shame or judgment. And while some did take longer to receive healing, answers, rest, or providence, God was and is faithful to provide. Christ has also taught us how to provide for those who are suffering. Sometimes this includes listening and encouraging somebody to go to counseling. For others, it might mean just sitting with them, pointing them to Jesus or pointing them to a doctor, and encouraging them to care for their physical and mental health. Regardless of the measure, each includes supporting one another in triumph and tragedy, not criticizing their struggles with cliches that sound godly but aren't. While spiritual life is crucial to your overall well-being, including prayer and Bible reading, it's not the only thing we need to heal our mental health. It's a common misconception that people who are struggling with mental health just lack faith. For most, this certainly is not the case. Although things like anxiety and depression have impacted my walk with Christ, they've not caused me to turn away from God, but rather cling closer to Him. In fact, it's in these most painful times that I remember our forefathers in the Scriptures, or I look to Jesus, who suffered greatly on my behalf. There is a reason 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that His power is made strong in our weakness. But this cliché that all you need to do is pray more that makes the assumption that individuals aren't reading their Bibles and praying, or if they are, they need to do so more or in a different, better way. As Sarah Robinson notes in her book, I Love Jesus But I Want to Die, seeking medical care for mental illness or any illness is not a lack of faith or a rejection of God's provision. Good doctors, scientific research, and advances in health technologies often are His provision. Sometimes God sends us resources outside Scripture – fresh air, exercise, church families, doctors, medicine, and counseling. Of course, the spiritual resources He has provided are life-giving wells that we can't do life without, but to ignore the rich provisions and helpmates He's given us outside the Scriptures forfeits the full life He calls us to live. If I could go back to my past self, I wish I could tell him that the words he heard criticizing him for his depression were not from God. And though they did have well-meaning intentions, God isn't peering down from heaven waiting to hit me with a lightning bolt for every emotion or illness I face. God's not ashamed of me. He doesn't think ill of me. He certainly isn't mad at me. But He does love me. He sees me. He cares and He wants me to seek help for my struggles, using the resources that He has blessed us with. Beyond reading my Bible and praying or talking with trusted family members, friends, or clinical professionals, God wants me to know that healing is possible. But it's not a one-size-fits-all answer. Sometimes it takes time and tapping into the life-giving wells that He has placed on this earth for us. Over the last... 20, 25 years or so, I have heard cliches like these that could have harmed my mental health had I not known better, although they did make me question my faith. Temporarily. But statements like these help no one. In fact, there are a few things you need to know that might make you feel a little less alone in all of this. First, know that mental health struggles, despite people trying to hide them from the world, are a lot more common than most people think. John 16 verse 33 says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. The enemy would love nothing more than for you and me to believe we're the only ones struggling. Sure, it's easy to look around at everybody who seems to have their lives together and wonder 
Well, what's wrong with me? The recent studies indicate that one in eight people worldwide live with a mental health disorder of some kind. Anxiety and depression are two of the most common, which is why I spend so much time talking about them. Even more shocking, this struggle is not unique to our modern world. Like I mentioned before, we see stories in the Bible of people like David, a man after God's own heart, who had similar mental health struggles. It's unfortunately so much more common than many of us realize. Next, if you do struggle with depression, anxiety, or some other mental health issue, that does not keep God from hearing your prayers. If you believe this or if anybody's told that to you, it's a lie. Throughout Scripture, we see verse after verse reminding us that nothing separates us from the love of Christ, and He always hears our prayers. A great example is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. 1 Samuel 1, verses 10 and 11. Hannah is not able to conceive, and she vows to give her son over to the Lord if only he would remember her. She pours her heart out to God in the temple through prayer. She actually appears drunk and distraught when doing so. She expresses that she's only speaking out of her great anxiety and vexation, her words. Maybe you know what happens next? The Lord remembered her. She conceived a son, Samuel. The anxiety and despair she experienced did not keep God from hearing or answering her prayers. Also, if you do feel alone, you're not alone, because Jesus knows your turmoil personally. Sometimes that's exactly what it feels like, too, doesn't it? Turmoil? My soul and my entire being feel as if they're in turmoil. There's confusion, chaos, uncertainty, I experience physical symptoms myself that interrupt my daily life. I've told you about them. Migraines, a bad back, vertigo. I consider myself lucky, though, as compared to some people who have much worse problems than I do. Their anxiety feels too heavy for them, their darkness too deep. I don't know, maybe you can relate to that. Surprisingly, Jesus understands these feelings, too. In John 12, 27, Jesus himself says, my soul is troubled, as he's thinking about going to the cross. He says, Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. John 12, 27. That sounds anxious to me. Of course, Jesus was sinless in every way, but throughout Scripture we see examples of him relating to anxious feelings, even distress. The Greek word for troubled in this verse also means inward commotion, restlessness, or dread. Jesus understands what it's like to wrestle with heavy feelings and circumstances. If Jesus dealt with it, maybe that'll bring us some comfort. Our own Savior knows what we're going through because He went through it too. I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that somebody told me once that my depression was just in my head. Well, it's not, and maybe it's not for you either. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 43 says, Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. What is the root cause for the mental struggles we face? What if some of our daily habits are contributing to our mental health issues? I recently took a deeper dive into holistic tests and lab work in order to understand better what's going on beneath the surface of my own body and mind. For the majority of my life, I have believed this is just how I am, I'm stuck being this way, but the more I learn, the more I realize I may not be stuck in my physical issues. Might this be possible for my mental issues as well? Maybe not for everybody, but could we have more influence on our mental health than we realize? Maybe there's a root cause for the symptoms, an explanation, a reason. One thing is for sure, our mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being, it's all connected. 
Maybe your anxiety, depression, or other mental health issue isn't just in your head. Maybe it's in your body, your surroundings, or something else. Or in very rare occasions, maybe it is a spiritual issue. But that's between you and God. You two discuss that, not you and some know-it-all at church telling you that what you're feeling or experiencing is sin or because you don't have enough faith. Speaking of feelings, though, there is something to remember. You cannot trust feelings by themselves, nor should you. As powerful and convincing as your feelings might be, we can't trust them. This is the first thing I got to remind myself of when I start to spiral. I pause and ask, are my feelings telling me the truth about this situation? Oftentimes, they don't portray the full picture. I don't know about you, but my feelings can be deceiving. When we notice a thought that is stuck on a continuous loop in our brains, we can ask ourselves whether or not that thought is true, lovely, or pure. Philippians 4 verse 8 reminds us to think about these things. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Truth is unchanging. God's Word and His character remain true regardless of how we feel. His promises remain. Rather than letting our feelings consume us, we can anchor ourselves to truth and choose to believe what the Bible says even when we don't feel it. How's that saying go? Fake it till you make it? It has been shown in studies that if you act happy even when you're not, it can actually lighten your mood anyway. Do what you can to get out of that downward mental spiral. And finally, as I say so often in my Weird Darkness podcast, there is always hope. Not just a page on my website for resources to help with depression, anxiety, substance abuse, etc., but there's also true, godly, real hope. One of the hardest things about mental health struggles is that some moments feel so incredibly heavy and dark. Sometimes we feel too far gone. The weight of it all feels like too much to carry. We question our worth and our purpose. Life feels hopeless. I know it's hard to believe that, even on the darkest day, there truly is hope for you and me. So don't just take it from me. Listen to these words found in Psalm 42, verse 11. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. If you're one of the many who struggle with mental health worldwide, I hope you know you're not alone. Unfortunately, this is a daily battle for many of us. When things feel too heavy, there's no shame in reaching out for help. You are so loved. You are valuable. You matter. If you're walking through a hard season right now, reach out to a friend or a loved one. You can even contact a counselor or a therapist. If you're in distress or believe you might be in a crisis situation right now, dial 988 and speak with someone immediately. Or visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com slash hope. God created you uniquely, and the world needs your light to shine in it. Cling to these truths, tuck them into your heart so that you can recall them in the midst of those hard, heavy moments. And remember, you are never fighting alone. Your depression or anxiety is not a sin. It's not a lack of faith. That doesn't mean you should lay back and just accept it. Still, find help. WeirdDarkness.com slash hope or dial 988 if you are in a crisis situation. If you like what you heard, share this episode with others who you think might also like it. Maybe the person you share it with will want to join this weirdo congregation too. To join this weirdo family yourself, find us on Facebook, listen to previous messages, even find out how to join me in my daily Bible studies, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash church. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash church. You can find the sources I used for this week's message in the show notes. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me, weirdos, and until next time, Jesus loves you and so do I. God bless.